Forget your troubles, come on, get happy! It's the eighth annual Colorado Matters Holiday Extravaganza! This year, our headliner is all grown up. The return of a young busker we met years ago outside Coors Field. An Iraqi American comedian finds the funny where you might not expect it. Christmas with a man who has an amazing set of pipes, thousands of them actually. Some holiday sex appeal. For Hanukkah, we get to the roots of Klezmer and Kwanzaa across the generations. I'm your MC, May Ortega, from CPR's podcast, Quien Are We? Let's welcome our hosts, Ryan Warner and Chandra Thomas Whitfield. Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Happy holidays! Chandra, have you ever seen the holiday movie Love Actually? Yes, one of my favorites. I am a sucker for a romantic comedy. When I realized this was our eighth year, I immediately thought of the child dressed up as a Christmas octopus. The octopus costume's taken me months. Eight is a lot of legs, David. Mm. Eight is a lot of legs, enough to count the years of this extravagant tradition. And I wonder, Chandra, if you have a favorite scene from a holiday movie. Of course, and I'm dating myself, but a Christmas story. Remember when Flick stuck his tongue on a frozen flagpole? <laughs> As an avid talker, sometimes to Ryan Chagrin in the office, all I could think about was, ouch. Well, go on, smart ass and do it. I'm going, I'm going. Flick's spine stiffened, his lips curled in a defiant sneer. There's no going back now. This is next. Duck? Duck? Duck! Chandra, I have thought of that scene every winter. Anytime I pass a flagpole, I think, don't stick out your tongue. Yes. Ryan, don't stick out your tongue. Thanks, Chandra. <laughs> Okay, let's get to a young person who is much smarter than Flick. We originally met our headliner as she was busking outside Coors Field. Emelise Munoz started performing at age six, but it's been said that she has the voice of an old soul. She has twice won competitions at the Apollo Theater in New York. Rough, yeah, rough crowd, rough crowd. Munoz was our guest for 2018's extravaganza. She was 12 then, and we were so impressed, we asked her back this year as the main attraction. Let's welcome Emilys. Shining star above 
Emily's, let's catch up here in our cozy living room around the fireplace. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's all I can say. Wow is right. <laughs> you got your start as a kid busking around Boulder and Denver. You just turned 18 this week. I just did. Yes. Yeah, happy yeah. birthday to that's you. Serious. <laughs> You're a senior at Denver School of the Arts. What is a day like for you now? Oh, well, I'm a guitar major, so I have 99 minutes of guitar built into my day oh. instead of PE. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, I, get, I love any chance I get to play guitar, and then we get some time to ourselves, and then I get to songwrite. And you're not a vocal major, which you could easily be. Well, I guess. thank you. You're welcome, sure. <laughs> Tell us, how did you get started in music? Yeah, I've just always loved music. I have my parents to thank for that. I remember being real little, probably like three or four, and just riding in the back of my parents' Jeep with the doors off and the windows down and the, some Dave Matthews, some Brandy Carlisle blasting. And I just remember thinking, I want to do that. That sounds like a good time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I asked for a guitar for my fourth birthday. And um, my grandma got me a guitar, and oh. I started taking lessons when I was five. And then I would come every week with a new song for my guitar teacher. And I'd be like, I want to play this one, I want to play this one. Wow. <laughs> wow, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Is a guitar for a four-year-old a full-sized guitar? Oh, no, no. OK. <laughs> I'm just making sure. I was like, had this picture in my head. <laughs> What is something you've learned about yourself as a musician since we saw you last? That's a good question. I've definitely found myself a lot through the songwriting process. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, get, I, I love any chance I get to songwrite. I have a little list in my phone called my idea salad. Idea salad. Idea salad. Hashtag idea salad. Hashtag okay. idea salad, okay. yes. <laughs> well, you keep a packed schedule. Do you have time for friends and typical teenage stuff? Oh, always. And it's awesome because my good friends are from DSA. We songwrite all the time. Last night, my friend and I were FaceTiming and we call it a 34 minute, I don't know why it's 34 minutes, but it's a 34 minute song. And we'll give each other prompts and then we'll say, okay, okay, bye, and then we'll set the timer for 34 minutes and write a song, and then I'll call her back and I'll be like, this is the song. Wow. So yeah, that's what we do for fun. <laughs> Emily Munoz, thank you so much. And it's so fitting that she performed Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, because our show is inspired by the 1963 Judy Garland Christmas special on CBS, a festive affair in black and white set in what's supposed to be Judy's swanky mid-mod living room. I realize it's a little on the nose for a gay guy to swoon over Dorothy, but <laughs> stereotypes exist for a reason. <laughs> Anyhow, each year here at the Holiday Extravaganza, I get a chance to unearth a piece of Judy history. <laughs> Just go along, dawn till sundown. Here's the rundown. Every day that comes, comes once in a lifetime. Take each day. This is a short ditty, two minutes, 30 seconds, called Comes Once in a Lifetime. It has a carpe diem message. While the future waits, the present swings. And Judy recorded this song, sang it live on her variety show. And I wondered, where did this come from? Would you guess that its roots are in homelessness? It's an issue Colorado's all too familiar with. 
You see, an article ran in Harper's Magazine about subway homelessness. The author slept on subways and wrote about the people he encountered. All of that inspired a musical called Subways Are For Sleeping. It opened in 1961 on Broadway to mostly negative reviews. And it didn't help that the New York City Transit Authority refused to post ads for it on buses and subway trains, <laughs> fearing that it would sanction sleeping on transit. So that show largely fell out of our collective memory, but comes once in a lifetime, endures, thanks to our muse tonight, Judy Garland. So live, live. Now, there was a big oversight at last year's extravaganza, almost as big as parents forgetting to buy batteries for a new toy. So we were here on stage at Central Presbyterian, pretty much ignoring a massive musical instrument and treating it as scenery. And in your feedback, many of you said, this year, we want to hear the pipe organ. <laughs> Well, we listened, meaning this year we'll all listen to the organ itself and meet the musician who's played it for nearly a decade. Please welcome Will Smith. Yeah. Will's going to perform a seasonal song that's been around for, oh, just three centuries, Joy to the World. And of course, everyone here is invited to sing along. Yes, even you listening on the radio. But some quick instructions first. Yes. I'd love you to sing along at a very specific part of the piece. Um, and that is, so I'll play a few verses, myself, or a couple verses myself. You'll hear the organ get louder, um, the song build and get a little bit slower, uh, and then change keys. And that's when I'd love you to join me for a verse of Joy to the World. Wonderful. I just want to say, you're at an organ console that is the size of like a VW Bug. <laughs> yeah. Yes. OK. A holiday classic performed by organist Will Smith. He served as Central Presbyterian's music director until last year. He's a composer as well, and Will plays church organs across the U.S. and is currently based at Denver's Welshire Presbyterian Church. Let's hear more about this organ. We've got these beautiful painted pipes that date back to 1893. 
But it turns out these weren't making the sounds we just heard tonight. No, that's true. So everything that you see up there, you did not hear me just play because they're all just facade pipes. Um, they were actually part of the original organ, but uh, behind it is about 2,000 pipes that you did hear. Um, mm. And if you're sitting in the back row, although you probably can't quite tell because it's dark in here, but you can see some of those pipes poking up in the back. Oh. So, yeah. You know, it occurs to me, if you're a violinist, you get to carry your favorite violin with you. But you know, a church organ doesn't exactly fit in the seat in front of you. So when you're touring, how do you know what you're getting into? Yeah, well, um, sometimes you don't. Uh, ah. Usually, well, like the, an organist uh, will invite me, or you know, I would, someone who is familiar with the instrument would be the person to invite me and could tell me, or you can also find a lot of information online of like the builder and kind of see a stop list, which is essentially like the, the sounds that the organist has and determine kind of what sort of repertoire it does best. In other words, you do reconnaissance on an organ before you even get into town. Yeah, yeah, usually. Um, so you want to know kind of what, what it does really well huh. so you don't misprogram something that it can't do. Uh, you have made a living performing centuries-old church music, but I understand that you have a love for jazz improvisation as well. Is there an overlap? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, improvisation in general is something that organists um, use all of the time for, uh -huh. in a church setting, especially when you're just trying to fill some time for something that's happened or some music that hasn't gone long enough during. Um, so you have, yeah. to, you have to vamp in a church service. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. <laughs> that's exciting. Um, so the you know improvisation in, in a church setting or in a club setting or you know any time it all feels the same, and I love the sort of ephemeral nature of it as well, that it's just something that exists for this, this moment and for nothing more, basically. It, it did feel like you were showing off a little during Joy to the World. I've got to say, <laughs> was there any improvisation in what we, we just heard? Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah, being with thanks, us, Will. Thanks so much for having Lovely me. Lovely job. The Colorado Matters holiday extravaganza continues. As we head to break, some listeners share their holiday traditions. Here's a profound one from Shelley Scobie of Elizabeth, Colorado. My holiday tradition is preparing a Christmas dinner for our local fire station. The reason I do this is our oldest son, Kyle Scobie, passed away in 2016. Our Elizabeth Fire Department was on scene. They just struck a chord with me that I was very appreciative the way they handled all the situation. We are so grateful to our members, donors, and sponsors. You are such an important part of the work we do here every day. CPR News, CPR Classical, Indy 1023, Denverite, and KRCC in Southern Colorado wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you for being a part of the Colorado Public Radio family. And on behalf of listeners all over Colorado, thank you for your support. Welcome back to the Colorado Matters Holiday Extravaganza from CPR News and KRCC. I'm Ryan Warner. Denver comedian Ali Kareem tries to find the funny in even the heaviest subjects. He grew up in Baghdad, first under the regime of Saddam Hussein, then through the war. He learned English selling DVDs to Marines, later becoming their interpreter. He eventually landed in Nebraska, which he jokes looks like Iraq with grass. <laughs> now in Colorado, he's been a featured performer at Denver's High Plains Comedy Festival and the Boulder Comedy Festival. Please welcome Ali Kareem. All right, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you guys. Um, I had oral surgery on on Friday, so if you hear any whistling, uh, there's no birds, it's just me. <laughs> I'm sure some of you can relay. All right. Um, I wanted to buy a motorcycle, and a friend of mine told me, he said, motorcycles kill their owner. 
Uh, so I bought one and I put it in his name. Um, Uh, just to give you a little background about myself, like I said, I'm originally from Iraq. Uh, only been in the States for 10 years now. Uh, I'm from Baghdad. B-Town. <laughs> Nobody here from Baghdad? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, uh, our cats didn't meow. Uh, they meow. <laughs> And when you pet them, they go uh, Our dogs made a different sound. It's just All right. Um, uh, I learned English from selling DVDs to U.S. soldiers. Uh, anybody see me in a hurt locker? All right. Uh, learning English from soldiers was different. I taught myself how to read and write, and I was reading a book, and I learned that when letters are capitalized, it means you're screaming at somebody. And I thought about it, I was like, man, no wonder why my visa took three years. Uh, uh, this whole time, I've just been sending threats to the U.S. Embassy. Hello, where is my visa? <laughs> They're like, sir, stop yelling. Um, I moved from Iraq to Nebraska. Uh, thanks for using my joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> Nebraska looks like Iraq with grass. Um, <laughs> uh, Iraq is still better. <laughs> I worked in retail for three months. I was like, ISIS makes sense. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, I'm a U.S. citizen now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you know you have to study and memorize 100 questions about U.S. history, and they ask you 10 random questions to pass? Uh, you should know some of these questions. <laughs> All right. Um, what ocean borders the East Coast? Atlantic, yes. Thank you. Uh, well, they didn't ask me questions like that. Uh, they're like, have you ever been or participated in any terrorist activities? I was like, que? Uh, Uh, ceremony was a little bit awkward. Uh, they were playing Born in the USA. Uh, main guy looked at me, I got all nervous. I was like, I wasn't born in the USA. Um, I come from a Muslim family and uh, my mom called me the other day. She's like, Ali, I know you're in America. I know you're going out with these girls. I'm like, who is telling her this? Uh, it was my sister. Uh, <laughs> uh, and she's like, Ali, you need to get married. I was like, okay, mom. She's like, no, don't say okay. Say inshallah. Uh, inshallah means God willing. Uh, so I said inshallah, and Alexa's light came on. <laughs> I was walking around the house like, I love America. <laughs> Alexa, play Born in the USA. <laughs> um, 
I, uh, I did buy a motorcycle and I crashed it. Uh, I have metal in my leg um, and obviously the tooth. Uh, um, I was going through the airport and I alarmed and TSA was like, Sir, uh, you seem to have a metal object in your leg. I was like, it's a metal bar. Uh, but all they heard was, Allah Akbar. They're like, have you ever been or participated in any? I was like, I'm Puerto Rican. All right, you guys, that's my time. Thank you so much. Hi. <laughs> Sit on down. Thank you. Did you learn at, at some point that humor could help you in difficult situations? I feel like that's a universal thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Could would you say, give me an example where you used humor early on to deal with something hard? Uh, I used to pretend like I don't speak English when I worked as an interpreter. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, they're like, you're our interpreter. How come you don't speak English? I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, one time they believed me so much that they were like, hey, uh, you're fired. I was like, okay, what time tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You earned a ticket out of Iraq for yourself and your family because of your service to the U.S. military. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I wasn't in the military. I, I worked with the military, so I was a civilian contractor working with the military. I was oh, just yes, an interpreter. Oh, yes, but that's service. That's service. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. How did you adjust to that first winter in Nebraska? Uh, <laughs> that's service, by the way. <laughs> I, I crashed several times. Oh, in your car? Or <laughs> yes. the motorcycle, maybe? Yeah, w in my car. Uh, but no, it was... Uh, Nebraska is not... Uh, they have a lot of good people, I would say. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of good people. I love Nebraska. <laughs> Among the three, what's funnier? Iraq, Nebraska, or Colorado? Uh, they're each funny in their own way. Uh, what makes Colorado funny? Uh, I think the high altitude. I think people are just... <laughs> yeah. It's the high, all right. <laughs> yeah. Ali, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. Comedian Ali Kareem of Denver. The holiday extravaganza will be right back with a saxophonist who combines his faith with his art. But first, here's a zany listener tradition. My name is Julie Holstein, and I live in Denver, Colorado, and my family Christmas tradition is the Yule Log Hunt, a treasure hunt for a log. The hunt itself may be up to two hours. It could be on foot, it can be in a car. You'll most likely end up in a park looking for the log, but the log has also been hidden in different places, like in the host's doghouse, in the trunk of their car. It's been hidden in the fireplace, but you're running around like a crazy person with your teammates trying to find the log, and often that makes innocent bystanders very curious about what the heck is going on, and they ask questions like, "Are you? did you lose a child? Are you? <laughs> have you lost a pet? Can we help you? And so we have to explain, no, we're looking for a log. You're listening to CPR News and KRCC. Give the gift of Colorado this holiday season and support small businesses with CPR's Local Gift Guide. I'm Lauren Antonoff Hart. And I'm arts reporter Eden Lane. Check out CPR's list of Colorado gift ideas from special activities to shops where you can find weird but delightful surprises for your upcoming gift exchange. There's also a list of holiday markets that offer you a way to celebrate Colorado artisans. The Local Gift Guide is at CPR.org. From CPR News and KRCC, it's the Colorado Matters Holiday Extravaganza. Once again, Chandra Thomas Whitfield. I read a quote once that said, if you like an instrument that sings, play the saxophone. At its best, it's like the human voice. Another quote I came across said, the potential for the saxophone is unlimited. I suspect our next guest agrees with all of the above. His work has landed him on the Billboard charts, and his pieces played worldwide. 
including on Sirius XM and the Music Choice Channel on your cable box. Please join me in welcoming Colorado native and saxophonist extraordinaire, Ron McMillan. Thank you for having me. Where exactly did you grow up in Colorado and how do you think the state has shaped your musical style? Well, I grew up in southeast Denver, close to the Denver Tech Center area. Um, yeah. <laughs> Shout out for Denver Tech Center. <laughs> Colorado, uh, we hadn't been back when I grew up. I won't say when that was, but uh, <laughs> we weren't given a lot of credit musically back then, but we had a lot of talent here. Um, so playing in band in high school and at the college level, I. Um, got a chance to meet a lot of native people here in Colorado that actually became uh, famous artists and stuff like that. So the inspiration was there talent wise, but I played in church because my dad is a pastor or was a pastor. And um, I, I just was around music my whole life. He, every person in my family is a musician. Well, you must have the best breath control playing at a high altitude. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you agree. Speaking of style, yours has been described as a mixture of gospel and smooth jazz. How would you describe your style? Um, actually, I think those are my words that I put <laughs> on my bio. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you where that came from. Um, I'm actually a, a minister, and um, so I followed my dad's pathing and everything. So I grew up in a gospel church, and when it came time for me to become a professional recording artist, I was actually trying to break into the gospel instrumentation industry. What happened, God placed in my path uh, one of the top in the world producers in smooth jazz. So he liked my sound and everything, so it combined his smooth jazz style with my gospel playing, and people loved it around the world and said I sound different and stuff like that. So, you know, a good different, yeah. So fusion. <laughs> yes, fusion, <laughs> yes. Some of your jams are talking about Jesus from within, the walk, and press toward the mark. Having heard you live before, it's clear to me that your faith is at the center of what you do. What has it meant to combine your faith with your gift of music? Well, they, they intertwine together. Um, I have been playing the saxophone since 10 years old and has been playing in church since then. It intertwines and, and me being a minister, it, it's just together, you know? <laughs> That's the only way I could explain it. It's, uh, they go together and they are who I am. Without further ado, here is Colorado native and saxophonist extraordinaire, Ron McMillan of Aurora performing Mary, Did You Know?
saxophonist Ron McMillan, who lives in Aurora, performing Mary, Did You Know? Ryan, what I love about working at CPR, specifically Colorado Matters, is the family environment. I certainly spend more time with you than I do my own family, <laughs> who apart from my boyfriend are all in a different state. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, now you get to be a part of mine. Meet my two sons, Riley. And he's about to turn 12 this month. And Miles, who just turned double digits, 10 years old, on Tuesday. <laughs> now you get to see what mom does for a living. They tell me they Googled me and figured out that I'm famous. And I say, no, Ryan Warner is famous. I just work here. <laughs> my, my mom certainly thinks I'm famous. <laughs> yeah. Chandra, I'm already feeling like part of the family. Thank you. Awesome. Before I got married and had children, I always knew that Kwanzaa was a holiday tradition that I wanted to incorporate into my family life. And we've done just that since we've moved to Colorado in 2012. Please also welcome to the stage our friends Sadie and Daylin. There are a lot of myths and all out confusion about Kwanzaa. So Miles, briefly tell us what is Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa is an annual holiday that was founded by a college professor way back in 1966 as a way to honor African American culture. Friends and family gather each day for a week to give thanks, exchange gifts, and share meals with each other. My favorite part is the drumming! Riley? When is Kwanzaa actually celebrated? Kwanzaa is celebrated each year from December 26th through January 1st. <laughs> the holiday centers around the seven principles that the African American community is encouraged to focus on all year long, such as unity, purpose, faith, and creativity. Each day we light a candle on a candle holder like this one called the Kanara that symbolizes each of the Kwanzaa principles. Okay, Sadie, there's a myth that Kwanzaa is a replacement for Christmas, but not true, correct? No. People can celebrate both Christmas and Kwanzaa if they choose to. It's not a religious holiday, it's a cultural one. It's all about getting together for food, fellowship, and fun. Gifts are often exchanged, but one difference is that we're encouraged to make the gifts and not just buy them. I think that makes it extra special. Daylin, wrap this all up for us. What else can you tell us about Kwanzaa? Even though Kwanzaa lasts for seven days, the big celebration is on December 31st. Yes, New Year's Eve. That's when family and friends gather. Many times we wear bright African-style clothing and have a large piece called Karamu. We play music, dance, and sing. Kwanzaa is important, but it's also a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daylin, Sadie. Riley and Miles for schooling us all on the celebration of Kwanzaa. <laughs> we will share a list of Kwanzaa events happening across Colorado on our website, which is CPR.org. After the break, the conclusion of the eighth annual Colorado Matters Holiday Extravaganza. We'll go from the Kwanzaa Kinara to the Hanukkah Menorah, but first, another listener tradition. My name is Eli Clyde. I live in Lafayette, Colorado, and my holiday tradition is that I always make the same meal my mother made when I was young for Hanukkah. She always made chicken soup with matzo balls, brisket, and latkes. It's great because it's like my parents are in the room with us. My mom's latkes were so crispy. We used to try other people's latkes and they would be these sad, flimsy things that were more like pancakes and a latke should be crunchy. I do make her latke recipe still. I changed her soup recipe, but I, I make her latke recipe. You can actually find Eli's Modified Soup Recipe at CPR.org. We'll be right back. Crowds, construction, and a general sense of chaos. Does flying for the holidays really have to be so challenging? People have prioritized travel. I mean, we are seeing numbers 
that are extraordinary. Get hacks from insiders at Denver International Airport about keeping your stress in check. Plus, CEO Phil Washington on what the airport's doing to handle more and more people. It's all at CPR.org. Welcome back. Now, a story of the season from one of Colorado's oldest churches. Each December, Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish in the San Luis Valley honors its namesake with a three-day fiesta. KRCC's Shauna Lewis takes us to a celebration whose roots go back generations. Bells mark the beginning of the fiesta of the Lady of Guadalupe. Lifelong parishioner Martha Abeda says, the celebration is steeped in tradition. I'm 86 years old, <laughs> and I can only speak for part of those 86 that I can remember. But as far as I know, those traditions have been there for over 100 years. Or longer. It's been nearly 170 years since settlers arrived in Conejos. That's when one of their pack burrows refused to leave. They emptied his saddlebags and in it they found a, a small statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The uh, travelers assumed or felt that the burro did not want to move because Our Lady of Guadalupe was sending us a message of some sort that she wanted to stay where she was. So they decided to build a church in her honor. <laughs> Each year in mid-December, the parishioners fill their church with roses, one of the many ways they celebrate the Lady of Guadalupe. It's very beautiful. Our church has a lot of color to it. It has gold, has reds and silver. The roses enhance the colors of the church. Why roses? Father Sergio Robles Cardenas says in 1531, the Virgin Mary, or Lady of Guadalupe, appeared to a man named Juan Diego in what is now Mexico. She asked for a shrine to be constructed there, but the local bishop didn't believe his story. So Juan Diego is telling her, the bishop doesn't believe me. He wants to prove that you are real. So. Our Lady Guadalupe is telling him, just go to the hill of Tepeyac and you are going to find some roses over there. Roses, blooming in winter. Juan Diego took the miraculous flowers to the bishop, and the cloak they were wrapped in was imprinted with an image of the lady. So now, in the 21st century, vases filled with roses surround the altar in Conejos during the fiesta. Father Robles says, it's important to maintain these kinds of traditions. If we lose our traditions, we are losing our culture. If we are losing our culture, we are losing our identity. Martha Abeda says there are more than 400 congregants listed on church rolls, although many aren't active. But everyone is welcome to join the celebration and enjoy the good food shared at the church during the fiesta too. Burritos, tamales, uh, pozole, menudo, ponche. For the kids, we have uh, ice cream floats. And for the older people, I mean, we have some margaritas. And Frito pie. Meanwhile, there's another tradition in the making at the historic church in the San Luis Valley. During the last few years, the parishioners have built a sacred labyrinth on the church grounds using traditional adobe bricks. They hope to open this new place of prayer in the spring. Shauna Lewis, KRCC News. Also, if you don't go to a church or a synagogue that serves margaritas, <laughs> you're doing something wrong. Okay. <laughs> klezmer is a Jewish style of folk music, and Colorado has a thriving klezmer scene. Let's meet a singer and fiddler who keeps it thriving. Eitan Cantor will perform a Hanukkah medley with some of his musician friends. Chag Sameach, happy holidays to you. Chag Sameach, it's great to see you. You're looking a little less exhausted and less greasy than when I saw you last week after you had just finished judging the Jewish Community Center's potato latke frying competition. <laughs> There's a lot of potatoes, <laughs> a lot of potatoes. 
Chag Sameach Eitan, and let's first dive into some delicious vocabulary. The word klezmer is really packed with meaning, isn't it? That's right. Klezmer is not traditionally the name of a musical genre. It actually describes a person. It comes from the Hebrew words kli, which means vessel, and zemer, which means song. So if you're a klezmer, that means you are a vessel of song, and we can all be klezmorim. We can all be vessels of song. Oh, lovely. Since 2016, you've been part of the band Upshirin, which is like also a name packed with meaning. And Upshirin is a celebration of a first haircut of a little boy, usually around age three in the Orthodox Jewish community. And our old band, Chad Gaba, which means unibrow in Hebrew, uh, <laughs> that was also a, a hair name, so we wanted to have a hair name, and we wanted it to be Yiddish this time, because we focus on Yiddish music. And we also wanted to put the word shir in there, as someone in the band pointed out, because the word shir means song. So it kind of sounds like, up with the song. Up shirin. Why unibrow? <laughs> you don't have one, I just want to say, for the people listening to the radio, if they were wondering. Give us just a quick rundown of Colorado's regular klezmer events, and do you have to be Jewish to feel at home? You absolutely do not have to be Jewish to feel at home in any of Colorado's klezmer events. I'm one of the co-organizers, along with trumpeter Tung Pham, of a monthly event called Festo Festo. That is, yeah, that is Colorado's monthly klezmer and Balkan music concert and jam session. It usually happens at the Mercury Cafe, but sometimes it also happens at the JCC. And we're lucky to have an amazing scene here. Um, I want to give a shout out to Hal Aqua, who leads the band Hal Aqua and the Lost Tribe. They have been putting on the event Klezfest for many years now, and it's amazing. It's usually around Christmas, uh, because Jews need something to do on Christmas Eve. You can only eat so much Chinese food, is the point. Yes. And one more exciting event that's coming up, we're having, for the very first time, a multi-day Klezmer Festival here in Colorado called Klez Colorado. That's going to be happening the first weekend of May. Wonderful. Okay, tell us briefly about this Hanukkah medley and then introduce us to the other performers, would you? Sure. We're going to start with a classic tune called Mi Yimalel. We're not going to sing the words to it, but the words are about the sort of story of the Maccabees. Then we're going to go into the English version of the song Hanukkah O Hanukkah. Then we'll have a little interlude of an original tune that I wrote called Vishamru, and we'll close with the Yiddish version of Hanukkah Oi Hanukkah. <laughs> and I'm so lucky today to play with these incredible musicians. We've got Annie Aqua on the fiddle. Yeah. We've got Adam Loudermilk on the poik drum. And Ben Cohen will be playing the accordion tonight, but if you were here a couple years ago, you may have heard him on the guitar, you may have seen him in other contexts on the harpsichord or the clarinet. We haven't found an instrument yet that he can't make sound good.
A Hanukkah medley from Eitan Cantor and his band. Cantor is musical director at Denver's Hebrew Educational Alliance. And be sure to check out Klezfest and Festo Festo. As our holiday extravaganza comes to a close, here's a final heartwarming tradition from another Colorado Matters listener. My name is Mary Carter. I live in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. My Christmas tradition is to sleep under the Christmas tree at least once during the holiday season. This tradition started with my son and I. When he was little, we put the blankets out, gather around. We would not do it on Christmas Eve, of course, because who comes on Christmas Eve? You cannot be under the Christmas tree. When I met my now husband, I invited him to join me under the Christmas tree. I'm May Ortega with Chandra Thomas Whitfield and Ryan Warner. A big thanks to our tireless production crew. Let's hear it for them. Happy holidays from CPR News and KRCC.